Hey everybody and welcome to the final chemistry um, HSE revision lecture. In this lecture we'll be going through um, study techniques, how to approach chemistry in the next few weeks, and also the best approaches to difficult questions in the exam paper itself. Um, I really hope you found these videos useful. We release these videos for a huge number of subjects so make sure to check them all out. Uh, but let's get started. So chemistry is in a month, probably less. So it's really important that you're using your time wisely. If you're just sitting down and planning to study chemistry but not really sure what you're doing, then you're wasting a huge amount of time. It's important that you have a plan, that you know where you're up to and that you know where you're going to be focusing, focusing your attention next. And that's true for all of your subjects, not just chemistry, not just science. You should be studying smart and efficiently as you gear up towards the HSC. I think it's important that you give yourself a break. Now, hope you need to be over this by now, but hopefully after you finished your trials, whilst school was finishing up and you were having your graduations and that sort of thing, you managed to have like a fairly substantial break. You need to be beyond this now. You need to be back into study. You need to be back into work. You need to be ready to be putting in the hours so that you can just get through your HSE exams. You're almost done. You're almost there. So now is the time for that final push. That being said, you obviously do need to continue to take breaks throughout your study period. You shouldn't be studying for days on end, never leaving your room. Take a break at least once a day. If you want to take an entire day off, absolutely, that's a fantastic idea. Uh, factor your breaks into your study. Make sure that you keep yourself healthy and don't just literally sit at your desk for eight hours a day because you're just not going to be studying efficiently because your brain is going to turn to mush. Now... There's an important component of study, which is the preparation, which I know a lot of students don't actually do and they don't consider before they start to study. Again, they just sit down and hope for the best. It's important that you prepare for your study. It's important that you have a specific list that goes through all of the information or topic areas or plans that you have to study and get down all the chemistry content that you're not so comfortable with yet. So I would recommend sitting down for a good hour, going through the entire curriculum and past papers and questions and problems in your trial paper, and writing down a specific list of information that you just don't know yet and that you plan on studying in the next few weeks. Examples might be disadvantages of ethanol as a fuel, the esterification prac, catchment areas. Be as specific as possible and make your list as long as possible. It's really, really important that you do this. On your list or on your plan, you should also have an area for past papers. So say that these were your subjects, physics, two unit maths, English, chemistry, and retail services. Have a list of them and then boxes next to them, exactly as you see on the slide. Whenever you do a past paper, fill in a box. And then at the end of the day, you can compare your how many past papers you've done for each subject. As you can see in the below example, We've spent way too much time on English and retail services, not enough time on physics, and about even on two unit maths and chemistry. Basically, you wanna be keeping these lines approximately even. Definitely focus on subjects that are closer to, that you're about to sit, for instance, or that you're weaker in. But using this technique, you can see if you're just obviously spending a wrong amount of time on certain subjects. So I would, it's just important to keep track of where you're placing your time so that you can identify any issues early on with your time management. Then comes the actual study. When you've got a comprehensive list, the first thing you need to do is go through and tick everything off on your list. Go over sections that you struggle with. Um, we'll talk about how best to write notes and stuff like that later. But basically you wanna be making sure that you're 100% confident that you've gone through every possible dot point and every possible topic area in the curriculum. This is the learning content phase. Finally, you just wanna be polishing off your content. That should be from about two weeks before your exam, maybe one. You wanna be doing every past paper you can get your hands on, every single HSE past paper. That's the best way to study, it's the best way to prepare, it's the best way to identify issues in your knowledge is to do past HSE papers. Now, if you're not doing any of the below um, dot points, then you're wasting your time when you do past papers. You should be doing them all under timed conditions. It's so important that you learn the difference between spending an hour answering an eight mark question 
and spending 10 minutes answering an eight mark question. It completely changes how you approach the question and it means that you have to learn to be succinct and accurate. Using your notes in progression, we'll talk about this in a bit, but basically what I'm trying to get at is that you shouldn't be using a massive 100 page note document when you're doing past papers. You should have a set of notes that just covers the information you don't yet know, just the information that you haven't covered yet that you don't memorize, and you can use those in the past paper preparation because of course you don't know it yet, so it makes sense to be referring to that document. It's important that you start answering every single question, regardless of whether you've learned the content yet, regardless of whether you're confident with it or plan to learn it in the future. If you just practice answering every single question, you're honing in your bullshitting skills. Without a doubt, in your chemistry final exam paper, there will be questions that you don't know how to do, without a doubt. And if you get into the habit of skipping those questions, then you're losing marks. Remember that every single question is doable. You've learned the content, and so you have to be able to answer the relevant question. So just give it a go. You'll get a couple of marks, and a couple of marks makes a big difference. Make sure to mark your work. If you're not marking your work, there's no point doing past papers. Go through, see how many marks you would have got, judge yourself harshly, rewrite answers when necessary. In particular, if there are questions that you get wrong, you should record them somewhere. Write them down in a booklet, and the next day, go back and redo the questions. It's all well and good to see that you got a multiple choice question answer wrong. Maybe you put down C, but you now realize the answer, answer should have been B. But if the next day you can't go back and explain to yourself why the answer should be B, then you haven't actually learned anything. Keep doing questions that you mess up until you 100% get them right. Now, when the exam's right around the corner, you want to start cramming. Basically, you want to be just using the document that contains the information that you don't yet know. Run through your notes and create the most succinct set of notes that you've ever seen. Use colours and learn from the notes. Rewrite them once you've learnt some of the stuff so that you get a shorter set of notes until you compress, compress, compress down to one page. Have fun with it. You've put in the hard work. This is just the final touches. This is just solidifying the teeny tiny bits of information that could get you an extra mark or two in the final exam. This is an example of the one page chemistry summary that I had going into my HSC exam. Basically, my areas of um, weakness were largely chemical equations, as you can see. So I wrote out my relevant chemical equations with all the states. I used colors to determine where, what sort of chemical equation it was or what it related to. And this is all I studied from in the preceding days um, coming up to my HSC. This is it. So you should be preparing this set of notes as early as possible. You'll note that the vast majority majority of it was my option topic, which was shipwrecks. Um, that's because it was the last thing I learned. It was just I didn't I wasn't didn't feel as strong with it as I did for the rest of the content. So again, you should focus your strength, focus your time towards where your weakness where you're weakest at the moment. I would seriously, seriously recommend putting together a document like this. Okay, so let's move on to more exam technique. There are two kinds of questions that students often struggle with, those being maths questions and extended response questions. However, remember that with a maths question, you've only got so many formulas. In chemistry, there are like three or four formulas. So there are only so many things you could possibly do. So if you have a technique, you will always be able to get the answers right. It's so, so important that you're comfortable with maths questions in chemistry because they are quite common and they are quite doable, regardless of how good at maths you are. So I would say that having some sort of method is key to getting maths questions correct. So here's the method that I would take. First of all, write out all the information you're given in SI units or relevant units and identify what you're trying to find. If you are given a question and the volume is in milliliters and you know that the formula requires the volume to be in liters, and you don't convert to liters, you'll get the answer wrong, which is why it's so, so important to write out the information in SI units from the start. Next, you apply any steps that you know you just have to do. Generally here in chemistry, that just means writing out a balanced chemical equation. You will almost always need to write out some sort of balanced chemical equation to tell you the molar ratio of the particular question. Then you can just apply whichever formulas seem to incorporate as many pieces of information as possible. At the end of the day, there are really only ever going to be one or two formulas you could possibly use, and those formulas are very, very straightforward. So why not just give them a go and see what happens? Worst case scenario, you'll get a couple of marks, but best case scenario, you'll probably get the answer right. 
Finally, you want to think about some important things. You want to think about the units that your answer is in, how many significant figures your answer should be to, and whether your answer actually makes sense. Let's look at an example from an HSE paper. It asks you to calculate the volume of sulfur dioxide produced when a full tank is consumed at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, I would recommend pausing the video and giving it a go yourself, but we will go through it now. <coughs> so we're talking about November 2007, and according to the text, that says that the, there must be 50 parts per million of sulfur in diesel. So what do we know? Sulfur concentration is 50 parts per million, and the mass is 60 kilograms. That's all we know. That's all the information we have. So remembering that parts per million is literally that, x parts per million is x divided by a million. We can simply multiply that by 50, so 50 parts per million is 50 over a million, which is 0 0.00005, and multiply that by the mass that we've got. So there's 50 parts per million in 60 kilograms, which means there are 3 grams of sulfur in 60 kilograms of diesel. Remember, this is all you could have done. You had a parts per million, you had a mass, so we just multiplied it to get the mass of sulfur. Now the question asks for the volume of sulfur dioxide. To do that, we're going to need a balanced chemical equation. Sulfur, which in this case may be aqueous because it's in diesel, but maybe solid doesn't really matter. Sulfur and oxygen become sulfur dioxide. It's one to one. So we have the mass of sulfur. We can calculate the molar mass of sulfur. All we can really do is find the moles of sulfur, which is equal to the moles of sodium of sulfur dioxide. Really easy. There's nothing else we could have done here. We just applied the only formula. Remember, really, the formulas are moles equals mass over molar mass and C equals N over V. Great. Then we multiply it by the molar mass of sulfur dioxide and we get 2.319. Now, is that the answer to the question? No, of course not. First of all, we need to think about units, obviously in litres. Next, we need to think about significant figures. Now, the values we've used in the question are 50 parts per million and 60 kilograms. That means that you could have chosen two significant figures, 5, 0, or 1, because 50 or 60 could be one significant figure. It's totally up to you. I would recommend always just choosing one and putting in brackets why you've chosen it. So just to remind everybody, you always use the number of significant figures that is the least number of significant figures given in the question. So in this case, 50 or 60 could be one or two significant figures. So make a decision, and I recommend just writing that decision in brackets, like I've done here. Easy. Okay, let's look at extended response questions. Again, in every extended response question, you know, you know the answer. You can get to the answer. And having a method to get to the answer is really, really useful. Start off by asking what the question is actually asking you, particularly in chemistry. Often when you read the question once or twice, it's not quite clear, or at least you think it's clear, but it turns out to be assessing something different. So read the question over a couple of times so that you really understand what dot point the question is trying to get you to think about. Next, decide on the best possible way to structure your answer. You shouldn't just be writing paragraph after paragraph. You should be thinking about subheadings, about diagrams, flowcharts, tables, that sort of thing. It makes the marker's life a lot easier if you make your structure clear and intuitive. Next, include a lot of information from various related dot points. I've written brain dump. Now, that doesn't mean you should be writing pages and pages for a six mark question. In fact, you shouldn't really be going over the allocated space. What it means is that where you have statistics, like we've talked about in past videos, or dot points related to the question that aren't directly answering it, but definitely beneficial to your argument. Just quickly link them in in a few words. It shows the marker that you have a really thorough understanding of the entire curriculum, and that you're confident in using your knowledge in novel circumstances. Finally, if there are any equations, formulas, or diagrams that you can use, use them. If there is a single chemical equation relevant to a particular question, you should be using it always. Remember that this is chemistry. If at any point there's a chemical thing that you can include, include it. Here's an example. Name a radioisotope used in a non-medical industry and discuss its use in that industry in terms of its properties. So let's use our method. 
The question is asking for the name, one non-medical use, and the properties, right? Straightforward. The table you use might be subheading, maybe identification, non-medical use, and properties. Maybe you could use a table with like properties and related to the use. The information is obvious, the properties relating to the use, maybe the type of radiation that the particular radioisotope emits. That's probably a different dot point, but you're linking it in, it takes no time at all, and it shows a thorough knowledge. Maybe you can name the particular non-medical industry, and maybe you can even include the half-life of your radioisotope, if you know that. Diagrams and equations are probably less relevant here. Maybe you can have the production, the equation for the production of the isotope. Uh, you could draw a synchrotron or something like that, but not so relevant here. But by thinking, this would have taken you two or three seconds to think about, uh, maybe a minute, maybe you could even write out a plan. But if you do that, and if you are confident with the direction of your answer, you could get five out of five for this question rather than three out of five or four out of five. Here's another example. Identify two, using two examples, analyze how the features of catchment areas will determine the water treatment necessary to make water safe to drink. And here are just some examples. You can talk about debris, general contamination, but by subheading it, potentially by dot pointing it, by including words like screening, E. coli, hypochlorites, you're really impressing the marker. You're showing the marker that you understand what the question is asking, why the question is asking it, and what dot points it's asking you to look at. Those are my general tips for studying for chemistry and for getting through the chemistry final exam. I hope these videos have been um, helpful for you. I hope that they'll help you in your final weeks of your HSC journey. We do have videos for a whole range of subjects, and we do sell complete course notes for courses such as chemistry for $25 at atarnotes.com if you find if you're feeling a bit worried about your final chemistry exam, exam. In the meantime, best of luck with your study. I hope that the paper is kind on you and thanks for listening.